a distinguished speaker today, Professor Elizabeth Berger from the University of California at Riverside, where she is assistant professor of uh, anthropology. And uh, she was trained at the University of uh, North Carolina in bioarchaeology, one of the um, subdisciplines of archaeology that is now making uh, huge waves everywhere. And of course, uh, that's something that people are very interested in in China. And it so happens that Professor Berger is perfect uh, in Chinese. And so she has been able to conduct important fieldwork there. Um, her dissertation, as far as I know, hasn't been published yet as a book. Articles, but, not as a book. Not, yeah. Yes, but there are numerous articles. And um, this work actually was generated at uh, a site in central Shanxi province, where UCLA was involved in running a field school for more than a decade. And in theory, we might still continue it if um, the times allow. But uh, anyway, that uh, field school involved the excavation of uh, the prehistoric Neolithic site of uh, Yang Wan Chai. But at that site, of course, since uh, the area had been inhabited over the centuries, there were also later finds. And it's about these finds that we are going to hear about, uh, uh, to hear today. Uh, Professor Berger was uh, for a while, in fact, the, the um, field director of, uh, of the American field director, anyway, of the field school, and uh, an important, a very important member of the team. Um, and uh, that's when she um, collected the materials we are going to hear about today. So, let me uh, ask you to join me in welcoming very cordially to UCLA, Professor Elizabeth Barriga, for what is hopefully be the first of many visits. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and to share this work. So my, my main line of work is in uh, prehistoric bioarchaeology, Bronze Age, um, transition and human environment interaction and climate change. And so to have the opportunity to work on historical materials has been a, a, a big shift and really, really stimulating for me. So I'm um, very interested to hear feedback and, and ideas and thoughts from people who work on historical periods because I want to continue this line of research. Um, so the I want to just give a content warning. That there will be pictures of human remains in this talk. Um, that is um, not... So the, the work that I'm going to talk about in this talk is conducted with Chinese colleagues in China and Chinese institutions where um, the study of human remains has a different cultural and legal framework than it does here in the United States. And so, um, for example, sharing the names of specific historical individuals that I'm going to be showing the remains of today is not something that is, is something that's considered um, acceptable there culturally. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that before I um, get started. So, as Lotar said, the material that I'm talking about today came from a site in Shanxi that is primarily under investigation as a Neolithic settlement and a Neolithic cemetery, but there is some later uh, usage of the cemetery that is actually directly intrusive into the Neolithic graves, um, which is interesting in its own right, but that's uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. The framing of the talk is an area that we could call historical bioarchaeology. My training is in anthropological archaeology and biological anthropology, so that really informs my approach to this work. And so in a framework of historical bioarchaeology, we have multiple types of sources that come together and speak to each other. You have, for example, texts that are recounting the main events of not only entire regions or populations or even families, but individuals in this case. So we have texts that record the individual's life events, their specific relationships, their status within their community, their interests. Um, and then we have their skeletons, which relay an entirely different set of information about their daily activity, their diet, any injuries or diseases that they suffered during their life. And so when you interpret both of those the textual and the skeletal record in the context of the archaeological record, you get some very interesting results. 
And what those, those results come out of what I'm calling productive tensions. So there's multiple tensions within the approach of historical bioarchaeology, three main tensions, um, that between the skeleton and the textual record. We could also call them dialogues, tensions, dialogues, but they are productive. Um, so skeleton versus text, the individual person versus the population, and the public sphere versus the private sphere. So first, we have information that is inscribed in texts, um, in this case, both historical uh, primary sources, such as county gazetteers, which I'll be talking about, and also um, the uh, tomb inscriptions that give information about individuals. And then we also have information inscribed in skeletons. And both of those are obviously very different types of sources, and there are different forces that create those two different records. So I'm going to make the argument that, of course, we shouldn't be privileging one over the other. They both contain different types of information that overlap and sometimes contradict, but those contradictions are not um, something that we should dismiss as a problem or try to resolve. I'm going to argue, which is something that other historical archaeologists have written about very eloquently, that when there's a discrepancy between the skeletal and the textual record, that's actually a fruitful thing to explore because it teaches us about the forces that created both of those records. Um, in terms of the population versus the individual, historical bioarchaeology, in some sense, is about populations, right? So bioarchaeology as a field, especially in North America, is very interested in the population level. So what are the big trends in health, in status, in um, sex differences, in demography? And those are things that we can study, but there's also a way to study the lives of individual people. The analysis of an individual life can reveal a lot about the past if we contextualize it within the broader population. And the population can, can give us more information if we look at how those population level forces play out in the lives of individuals. So this is something that's been discussed also by historians um, in the form of micro histories or the biographical turn. So this is something that, that is being discussed um, from a theoretical perspective in multiple fields. Um, and then finally, the public versus the private. This, this is um, an interesting area for the particular case I'm going to talk about today because we have, as a textual source, we have epitaphs, right? Ins inscriptions that were included in graves, which were, in some sense, both public and private texts. They were written and commissioned um, to be inscribed on stone on the uh, event of someone's death and placed inside the tomb. So sealed inside the tomb and therefore not visible to the public. But they were also, the text of these inscriptions was then often published in a form that was circulated to the broader community. So it was intended to be shared, intended to be made public. Uh, and the skeleton itself is also public and private in a way. The skeleton records the most intimate details of a person's life, right? What, what their day-to-day -day activities were, what their um, injuries were, what their what the diseases were, what they ate, what they, if they chewed on a toothpick every day of their life, those are the private details that are recorded in the skeleton, but they also record their place in society, right? So how your gender interacts with your status and how your place in your community affects what your body endures during your lifetime. So that is in a sense also a public, um, public information that is recorded in a skeleton. Um, there's an interesting formulation that, that I find very helpful from Dorothy Coe, which is um, discussing how the body functions in historical China and that um, basically the way we conceive of the body now as being totally segregated from the population, right from the outside world, this is my individual body and there's a boundary around it and that is separate from my relationship to other people, that in historical China, it seems that that, that boundary between individual and um, public may have been a bit more fluid. So that things such as bodily adornment, like hairstyles and clothing, and bodily modification, like foot binding, were not seen as so different. And they're both important. The body, an individual's body and how it was presented was important in upholding social roles and, and social distinctions um, of, of class and ethnicity and gender. And I'll get into that in more detail during the talk. Okay, so the site to place us geographically, here's Shanxi province, 
zooming in, this is the Guangzhou Basin, the modern city of Xi'an, and then the Jing and Wei River Valleys. So we're talking about an area in the Jingwei floodplain. Um, this is a map with the modern streets overlaid, and these are the modern villages. And so we have the Neolithic site of Yangguanzhai, which takes its name from this village. And then just to the northeast of it was discovered a Neolithic cemetery that was associated with the Neolithic settlement and also multiple historical periods of graves, including uh, the, the largest number of them being from the Ming Dynasty. And that cemetery, the Ming Dynasty Cemetery, is uh, takes its name from the, this village, Xuzhuan. So we talk about the Yangguanzhai site, that's referring to the Neolithic site, and then Upper or Shangshu Tsun is referring to the main cemetery. So you can see this is this is Neolithic burials, most of these. Um, and there's been 213 excavated as of the last official report, at carbon dated to several thousand years ago. And then we have 21 graves or tombs from the late Ming Dynasty. Um, so much, much more recent, obviously, in historic time that were discovered during the excavation of the Neolithic cemetery and are intrusive, actually deeper than the Neolithic graves. The Neolithic graves are extremely shallow under the modern surface and are very poorly preserved as a result. But the Ming graves are very deep and also are uh, brick structures. And so they are extremely well preserved. The skeletons are in very, very good condition. Um, those graves, the Ming graves, were excavated in 2014 and 2015 by a team from the Shanxi Kaoguya Yuan, the Shanxi Archaeological Academy. Um, led by Yang Liping, who was one of the field directors um, and was, he was the field director of the Yang Wanjai project and uh, one of the directors of the field school. Um, and of those 21 tombs, four of them contain stone epitaphs. So these are large stone slabs that have been engraved with a composition that some of you might be familiar with this genre called Muchermin. So a, a description of a person's life. It tells, um, when they were born, the year they died, the year they were interred in, or buried in their tomb, which is often different from the year they died, uh, the main events of their life, what their personality was like in an idealized form, right? But uh, a description of their life and a description of their lineage and their family history. So an extremely rich source of information. Um, the, the stone epitaphs were transcribed and translated by Yewa, who was one of the other directors of the field school. Um, and also a graduate of UCLA. And so the content of the epitaphs that I'm gonna talk about today are uh, from her work. And then I also was able to examine the skeletons from the Ming tombs. So there were 23 individual skeletons available to examine. Um, so this is an example of one of the epitaphs. Again, they trace the whole history of the family in the area and then also the individual person's own life, their dates, and then more sort of colorful details, um, anecdotes from their life story. And importantly, we have that for male and female uh, members of the family. So we have a picture of, of men and women's lives. Um, and so this, this, this site gives us a really exciting way to use multiple methods. Um, and the methods that we're using are somewhat eclectic, right? So we have epigraphy. We have also historical research on primary sources, which I'm going to talk about. We have archaeological research on the tomb structure and tomb contents. And then we have the osteological analysis. Um, and so it's uh, it's been I've had, a, I've spent a lot of time thinking how to bring these different records together and make them talk to each other in a meaningful way. So I'm very interested to hear thoughts, right, on, uh, on this, because I'm hoping it's going to be an ongoing area of research. Okay, so historically, um, so we have the epitaphs, of course, and then we also have other primary historical sources that Yewa was able to consult, such as county gazetteers. So these are local historical records um, of a particular county. The county we're talking about here is Gaoling County in Shanxi Province, and the first gazetteer was written in 1541, so during the Ming Dynasty, and then there's been multiple editions up to the year 2000, was the most recent edition of the uh, Gowling County Gazetteer. Um, she was also able to consult historical maps, um, and then we, uh, and then, and then we've also consulted 
you know, secondary historical sources. And so according to the epitaphs, the tombs at Shu Tsun belonged to a family called the Zhangs uh, that had lived in the area for about 900 years, according to the, um, to the description of their lineage. They were local landowners, gentry, local business leaders, sometimes minor scholars, um, and they had they made money from their land and they also had other businesses. Um, one epitaph describes their ideal as living by kung du, plowing and reading. So basically cultivating the land and cultivating the mind. That was their sort of ideal way of living. Um, they had lived in the area, as I said, for 900 years in several different villages, two of which actually still have the same name to this day. Um, so for over a thousand years, the to toponyms in this area are very stable. And um, <clears throat> one of the villages they had lived in was called Hanswin, which is still there today. It's now farther from the river, but at the time it was on the Jing River. It was a port town and the Zhang family apparently would build a pontoon bridge every season that they would maintain. So they were known as the pontoon bridge Zhangs, the uh, Fuqiao Zhangjia. Um, and they most likely would have belonged to a, a social class that was termed the um, Xiangshan, which is translated into English often as gentry, which is kind of misleading because it's not exactly equivalent to, say, English landed gentry. Um, the exact nature of this class during the Ming Dynasty is somewhat debated still, but it, it the Xiangshan probably included families who could afford education, um, and some of the members did achieve some kind of official status, some kind of official degrees through the um, examination system. One of the members of the Zhang family described in the epitaphs did achieve one, did achieve a, a degree at a government position, a, a lower level government position. And <clears throat> I found it in, I found it helpful to use a distinction that is drawn by James Schur, a historian who wrote about his, the, the history of rural Ming China. And he draws a distinction between gentry landlords and commoner landlords. So the distinction there is that gentry landlords would have had official titles and wouldn't have performed their own physical labor. And um, their status would have come not only from their land holdings, but also their official recognized titles. Whereas commoner landlords wouldn't have had any official titles. Um, they would have hired laborers, but also conduct, done some of their own labor on their own property. Um, the son, their sons would have worked the land, their wives would have made handicrafts, um, and they had education, they had scholarly aspirations, but they were mainly concerned with their businesses and the tending of their properties and their commercial endeavors. So they're described, they're, the ideal um, commoner landlord was someone who was thrifty and hardworking, uh, and they provided a lot of aid to their communities and so forth. And so I'm going to get into more detail in the epitaphs, but I believe that describes the Zhang family um, very, very accurately. This village here is Shu Tsun. It's there's a there's a Bietzu there, but this is Shu Tsun. So it's pretty much still in the same location today. Um, the Guangzhou region at this time was an exporter of wool, but the main agricultural activity was growing staples like wheat and millet. And <clears throat> the rural economy was shifting at the time. And so there was social and environmental conditions that were making economies of scale more desirable. So more and more land was being concentrated in the hands of fewer landowners. So you have instead of more small farmers, you're having more and more large farms owned by wealthy families. Uh, draft animals were used in North China at this time, but they were most uh, desirable and economically viable for large landholders. So people with more than 100 mu or 6.4 hectares of land. Um, and agricultural productivity was pretty stagnant at this time, actually. So uh, there was population growth, but agricultural technology was relatively stagnant. So the amount of cultivated land per capita was going down, which meant that life expectancy also was declining after about 1500. Population growth was slowing. Uh, and there was also unrelenting environmental disasters. We have multiple recorded droughts in the 15th and 16th centuries, floods across North China, um, epidemics accompanying those floods. Uh, the greatest famine in the Ming era took place in 1486 to 1487, and it's actually mentioned in the epitaphs, which I'll come to. Um, and so at this time when the Zhang family lived in 
Dowling County and when they were buried at Shu Tsun, they would have been local leaders in their communities um, and derived their authority from their um, from their wealth, but also through their moral authority and their charitable aid to their community. So it was a, an expectation of local leaders that they would, um, for example, feed the poor in their neighbor, either members of their own clan or, or their neighbors. Um, they would uh, maintain bridges. I already mentioned they did have a pontoon bridge. They would maintain temples. They would construct irrigation works. They would support local burial societies. And those activities were considered um, necessary duties of their station. Okay, archaeologically, there, like I said, there are 21 tombs. Um, most of them contain a single male and one or two females, the wives. And so there's a grave with three. So the center burial was a male and then two women on either side. Um, all of the tombs have six features, six architectural features. And kind of this is a very cool 3D scan that the excavation team made. Um, and an elevation drawing of the Menlo in that in that tomb. So there are six features of all of the tombs. There's first of all a tomb entrance. So either a shaft or as in this case, a, a stepped ramp going down to the entrance. Then there's an antechamber. Then there's a decorative gateway or a Menlo. Then there's a, a doorway. And then there's a burial chamber, sometimes multiple burial chambers. Sometimes the burial chambers were a vaulted brick structure, sometimes it was just an earthen chamber, and then often also um, side niches for holding burial goods. The, they also all contain wooden coffins, and some of those wooden coffins were inside stone sarcophagi, and they had lots of burial objects of different materials. There was silver and gold jewelry, lead and porcelain dishes, as we have here. We have a hairpin, we have uh, earrings. Um, and also coins, copper coins, which helped with the dating of the, of the tombs. And so there's a lot more detail on the excavation and the um, grave contents in these two published reports by the team from the Shanxi uh, Kaogu Yezhu Yuan. Okay, and now in terms of the osteobiographies and how they relate to the epitaphs, um, these are the four graves that contained epitaphs. Um, and then Middle East, West, those designate different individuals within the tombs. These are the names that we have recorded from the uh, epitaphs, birth and death dates, age at death. This is in Western Reckoning. Um, this is the final burial date. And then we can see the gap between their death and their final burial was, was sometimes pretty short and sometimes really long. Um, so this would have happened if, for example, the wife died first, she would have been put in a temporary grave. And then when the husband died, she would be moved to the same tomb. And that was the final entombment date. Um, this is the family tree of the Zhangs that Ye Wa was able to construct from the epitaphs. Uh, you can't read it from where you are. I'm happy to share it with anyone who wants to see the detailed version. But, but just from the four uh, graves that had inscriptions, we've been able to reconstruct this entire family tree. Um, I'm only going to talk about one of the graves today, just in the interest of time, but um, we've written this up into a paper that's under review right now, so I'm hoping it'll be out this year, so you'll be able to see a little bit more detail. Um, we have actually only this, what, what these asterisks mean is these three, we have both skeletons and epitaphs, this tomb contained epitaphs, but the skeletons were in particularly nice sarcophagi that were transported to a different field station for lab excavation. So I was not able to um, examine the skeletons from, from this tomb. But today I'm gonna talk just about tomb 53, which is the oldest of the, of the three for which we have both skeletons and epitaphs. Okay, so um, first we have uh, John Ray, who was the male occupant of the tomb. We have his first wife, Madame Schur. Schur, Schur, Schur. This second Schur is a title that I'm translating as Madame. So Schur would, uh, sorry, Schur would have been her maiden name, essentially. So we have Madame Schur. And then we have his second wife, Madame Wong. Um, and I'm going to talk mainly about John Ray and Madame Wong today. So John Ray 
according to his epitaph, married three times, uh, Madame Sher, Madame Wang, and then a Madame Zhang, who was not buried with him. We don't know why. So there were two, his first two wives were buried with him. Um, he had three sons, the first two of which, Zhang Rao and Zhang Xue, were buried with buried in the same cemetery, and we have their epitaphs as well. Um, and then he had a third son who was not found in the cemetery. Uh, he had three daughters from his first wife, and then three daughters and three sons from his second wife. And he is described as being both a businessman and a scholar. So he's described as having a very scholarly bent. He emphasized education for his children. He read books on divination and law. Even though he worked in trading, the community came to him for judgment when they had quarrels. They even asked him to rule on cases of murder. We don't know if all these details are literally true. The epitaphs are a very stylized genre. So there may have been anecdotes that were embellished or, or described in a certain way to um, emphasize his Confucian virtues. So we don't know if all of these anecdotes are literally true, but described that he was um, a, a leader in his community to the extent that he ruled on even cases of murder. He had very Confucian values. He treated his parents and his brothers well. He worked, and the epitaph specifically mentions that he worked hard in the fields. So again, this comes back to the family status as commoner landlords, right? They were wealthy, they owned land, but they did conduct some of their own farm labor. Um, there are anecdotes such as there was a man in the community named Yang Jiu Shi, who was a learned man in his 30s who was too poor to marry. So Zhang Rei was, had so much force, foresight that he married his fifth daughter to this young scholar. And then later the scholar passed the provincial examination and achieved the official rank of Juren, which would have been, given him a lot of status. And so everyone praised Zhang Rei for his, his vision in supporting this, this young poor scholar. Um, he apparently worked in the timber trade. So there's a story about him going to Gansu province once to get timber and there were some looters who had stolen timber and they were floating it down the river. And when they heard that John Ray was coming, they fled, right? So um, again, we don't know how much of this is literally true, but it's likely that he did work in the timber trade. And then the epitaph mentions in the 1480s that the Guangzhou area was struck by a famine so severe that people engaged in cannibalism and the Zhang family provided famine relief for which John Ray traveled a thousand li, meaning several hundred miles, with two donkeys carrying grains and food so his elders would not go hungry. Um, so that's uh, an example of not only community aid, but also him having close contact with uh, draft animals, which will become important later. He was apparently 80 years old when he died. Um, and then his son, his second son, Zhang Xue, went away to a place where there was a famous um, Confucian scholar named Ma Li and stayed there for three months in the bitter winter, begging him to compose the epitaph for his father. Um, and so this is uh, an example of great filial piety that he wanted a prestigious scholar to write the epitaph for his, for his father. Um, Okay, in terms of, so I'm gonna start showing um, images of skeletal remains now. So in terms of John Ray's skeleton, he was um, quite, again, his skeleton makes it clear that he was quite advanced in age when he passed away. He was mostly edentulous, meaning that he had almost no teeth left. This is his maxilla. So we're looking up at the roof of his mouth. There were all but two of his maxillary teeth had fallen out and he had a handful of teeth in his mandible. Um, he had five ribs on one side um, that were, this is, uh, this is his left side. So he, there are five ribs that were broken and healed. Um, clearly, this is one injury that he survived. He's not the only one, so I'm going to return to that later. He had pretty severe arthritis in his spine. These are three of his cervical vertebrae, um, and there's a lot of degeneration in on the surface of the vertebral bodies and then also on the joints between the vertebrae. But he didn't have arthritis elsewhere in his body, just in his spine. So that makes it likely that he wasn't doing hard labor for his whole life. He, having degeneration in your spine is very common for someone who's 80 years old, uh, but he was not a lifelong laborer. He also, this is um, the distal left tibiofibular joint. So this is his left ankle essentially. And we have these bony excrescences, so this extra bone forming, um, but there shouldn't be this wiggly bone between these two 
these two joint surfaces. Um, and so this may or may not have affected his walking. It could have caused him some discomfort when he was walking, but um, I'm going to come back to this later. It seems to be an example of osteochondroma, which is a benign bone tumor that arises from cartilage. And again, I'll come back to that in a little bit. He had what's called uh, periostitis, so uh, inflammation of the soft tissue around the bones on the, in this case, the tibia. So this striated bone was active periostitis, meaning that he was undergoing some kind of a systemic stress at the time of his death. We can't tell exactly what that was, but some kind of inflammation or infectious disease. So he basically, he was sick at the time of his death. We don't know what it could have been, but, but that's clear from the active periostitis. Um, his first wife, Madame Schur, there was not that much information on her in the epitaphs, probably because she died relatively young and she only bore him daughters. So none of her, so she, didn't buy, she didn't bear any sons so that she didn't really contribute to the family lineage. Um, so she, was, she had a relatively short epitaph. I'm going to talk more about the second wife, Madame Wong, who lived quite a bit longer. Um, she had three sons and three sons and three daughters. She's also described as being very pious, very uh, respectful, quiet, righteous. She didn't associate with lazy people. Um, she assisted John Ray in educating their children. She was very strict with the children, and she was very committed to principles of filial piety and duty. So there's some interesting anecdotes about that. It says that once her nephew was being abused by his grandmother and tried to run away from home, um, but Madame Wong talked to him about ethics and morals and his duty to his family, and he came to realize that he should return home and be a dutiful grandson. Um, and then in another anecdote, she had a different nephew whose wife was being scolded by her husband to the point where she considered taking her own life. Madame Wong explained to her the rules and principles that a woman should follow, the Fu Dao, um, and then the woman was relieved, and from then on, she told others about that episode and followed the Fu Dao. So again, these are very uh, idealized anecdotes, but they are meant to illustrate that Madame Wong was a very pious Confucian woman. She had a yet another nephew who she actually helped to marry because she convinced her husband, John Ray, to save up money to pay for that nephew's wedding. She paid for relatives who were sick to be fed, and um, she was good to people who worked for her. So again, the, the epitaph goes on about her virtues. Um, one interesting anecdote, it says that she one time caught a cold and the illness became chronic and reoccurred every fall and winter when the weather was cold. And even when she was sick, she would not stop leaving and her sons begged her to stop working, but she wouldn't. And she insisted on making her handicrafts. So that's, that's not only an example of her being hardworking, but it's also an example of her doing handicrafts herself. So that's another example of... Um, how the Zhang family fits into the commoner landlord category, right? So they not the, the men would do some farm work, the women would do handiwork. She was 60 when she died, 14 years before her husband. Um, this recurring illness is a bit of a mystery. There's no lesions of any kind on her skeleton that would help us diagnose what that could have been. Tuberculosis does actually have, can have a seasonal presentation but there was no evidence on her skeleton that she had TB. That doesn't mean she doesn't, but there's no way to diagnose it from the skeleton. She did also have that new bone, periosteal new bone on her tibias, but it was healing. So it means that she was not actively sick at the time of her death, but had been recently. Um, in terms of her skeleton, she was also mostly edentulous. So she was 60 when she died, not 80, but she had um, lost most of her teeth. So you can see her mandible here. There's no teeth left. That, those were all lost before her death. And then on her, ma uh, on her maxilla, sorry, on her mandible, she had only her anterior teeth. All of the molars had fallen out before her death. Um, she also had had a broken nose at some point. This is a healed fracture of the nasal bones. Could have been an accident. There's many different, not necessarily violence. There's lots of um, accidental causes for, for nasal fractures. Um, and she also had these, one of her remaining anterior teeth. I'm not sure if you can see it from back there. There's two grooves in the dental enamel. This is uh, called linear enamel hypoplasia. This is um, basically when you're a child and your teeth are forming. If something happens that stresses your body, 
it interrupts the growth of the teeth and then you end up with these permanent lines in the teeth for the rest of your life. Um, that could be caused by starvation, parasitic infection, infectious disease. There's no way to diagnose exactly what caused them, but she went through some kind of illness at least twice in her childhood. She had pretty severe osteoarthritis as well in most of her major joints, her knees, her arms, her hands, not her hips, which is uh, surprising, I think. Um, this, is, this, is her, this is the distal femur. So this is her knees, very intense degeneration. This is her knuckles here. So this is all this extra bone is evidence of osteoarthritis. Her, uh, these are her humeri, her upper arm bones, and she had very pronounced muscle attachments here. Um, this is called the deltoid tuberosity. It's where your shoulder muscle attaches to your arm bone. And so could mean that she did a lot of, she used her deltoid muscles a lot, right? So leaving, I don't know. This one muscle attachment is not enough to diagnose or, or determine exactly what mo movement someone was doing, but it, it would be consistent with doing um, activity that used the upper body. She had also what appears to be, this is her spine, this is her lumbar and the beginning of her thoracic spine. She had a condition called DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, which causes your vertebrae to fuse, among other things. Um, the cause of DISH is still not entirely clear. It's thought to be maybe associated with a rich diet, although it also has genetic causes. Um, this fusion in the vertebrae is very, very classic of DISH. And it's also possible that, that, that all of this extra, like this is pretty intense extra bone formation, even for advanced osteoarthritis. So some of this could be related to the DISH. Um, and then this I find very strange. She had a chronically dislocated shoulder, actually. So she had uh, her right shoulder was dislocated so that the head of the humerus was anteriorly displaced. Um, this is the right humerus. And here on the, these are the shoulder blades, the scapula, the left, you can see this is the joint surface, the glenoid fossa where the humerus head sits and it's normal. On this side, the humerus head was not sitting where it was supposed to, it was, it was pushed forward out of the joint socket and was resting on the front side of the, of the scapula. And so there's all this new bone that formed um, called a pseudo joint. So basically the bone was trying to stabilize itself and the head of the humerus itself was, was eroded away by friction with, with the pseudo joint. So this would have been very painful. It would have had to go on for quite a while to get to this point. Um, I'm not sure why it wasn't reduced, you know, fixed. Could be that it was a repeat injury that became, you know, maybe the ligaments became so loose that it wasn't possible to fix. Um, it's, it's not clear. Also, when, when you fit the humerus and the scapula together, they would have been um, abducted. So at an angle like this, this is clearly they fit together like this and, and her shoulder would have been at an angle. So that would have seriously impacted her, the movement of her arm and her ability to do things like weave or, or do handicrafts. Um, so it's interesting to me that the respiratory illness was mentioned in the epitaph, but not, not an injury like this. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the cemetery population more broadly. So I constructed these osteobiographies for the specific individuals that we have epitaphs for. That was only those three graves. There were 21 individuals whose skeletons were present. So I was also able to do an analysis more at a population level. One striking phenomenon is that um, about half of the women with preserved foot bones in the cemetery had bound feet. Um, these, this has already been published a few years ago if you're interested in reading more details. Um, these are the metatarsals, so the bones in the top of the foot of a woman who had what looked to be normal uh, metatarsals. And then these are the same from a different woman whose feet were bound. And so you can see they're much, they're shorter, the shafts are much more narrow, um, they're clearly altered. None of the four women with the feet that were obviously affected had epitaphs, right? So we can't actually date them specifically, um, but we can still surmise some things about their lives. Here we have another example of a metatarsal from an unaffected foot and a, and a bound foot. 
Um, this is the surface of the calcaneus, so part of the ankle of an unbound and a bound foot. And then these are the cuboids, which are tarsal bones, again, from the ankle of an unbound and a bound foot. So you can see the size, the size difference. Um, they, there was some effect on their leg bones, right? So the leg bones of the women whose feet were bound were smaller. Um, so that could mean during growth that they didn't walk as much that would have affected the robusticity of their leg bones. Um, their foot bones are obviously different, but there, this is a very small sample size, but there wasn't any evidence of earlier death or things like fractures. So there wasn't evidence that the women who had bound feet, for example, fell more often in their old age or suffered other injuries. Um, so there was no evidence basically that the bound feet affected their lifespan or their, their health more generally. We also don't know why only half the women had bound feet. This was still relatively early in the period when foot binding was spreading and becoming more popular. And so it's possible that not every woman had her feet bound at that point. It's also possible that the women whose feet were unbound are from an earlier part of the cemetery and the four whose feet were bound were from the later part of the cemetery. Um, again, we can't date them because there were no inscriptions um, in those graves. So this is a very small sample size. There have actually been about half a dozen other papers now published by scholars in China, one other in the US, but mostly in China on foot binding primarily from Qing dynasty cemeteries with much larger sample sizes and um, CT scans and all kinds of interesting things. So if you're interested, I, I suggest looking into that literature. Um, we also have the rib fractures. So I'm coming back to, I described how Zhang Rei has four healed five healed rib fractures um, in a row. There were three other males who also had fractured ribs. Um, we have M59. So this person, we don't know his name, but he had his fourth rib was fractured in, this is the um, sternum. So this is the breastbone and this is the fourth rib, which was broken in two places. So there's three pieces of rib here, which healed at a very strange angle and fused to the sternum. Um, we also have, John Ray, we have John Rao, who was his first son. So he has two, go away, two, two broken ribs. Um, right here is a fracture that healed. Here is a fracture that healed over but never reconnected, right? So there's a piece that was missing here. Um, and then his second son, John Xue, also had four broken and healed ribs in a row. Um, rib fractures obviously result from blunt trauma to the thorax. There's no record of specifically of warfare, violence, military service, anything like that in this time, um, in this area. And in modern populations, most rib fractures are caused, besides car crashes, which is obviously not a possibility for this group, um, is caused by animals kicking. At first I thought maybe um, horseback riding, falling off of horses, that actually typically causes upper extremity injuries or head injuries because you land like this. Uh, being caught, the rib fractures are often caused um, among stable workers. So not people who ride animals, but people who work with animals. Um, so again, this injury pattern is consistent with men handling large animals. Um, we have a mention of Zhang Rei taking the donkeys to bring food to his relatives during the famine. Um, and we know that, that draft animals in Ming Dynasty North China were mostly used by larger landowners. Um, and so we have both individual and population level historical records that suggest that these were men who would have had close contact with draft animals. Okay, now back to the ankle. So we have Zhang Rei had this extra bone in his ankle, and then there were actually two other individuals who had exactly the same thing, extra bone formation in the tibiofibular joint. So the joint where the two lower leg bones meet at the ankle. Um, based on my differential diagnosis, I think they are osteochondromas, which again is a benign tumor that arises from the cartilage. They're sometimes subclinical, meaning the person who had it wouldn't have known. So like this one, for example, it's just a little bit of extra bone formation. It's not fused. The two bones aren't fused. So this person may not even have known that he had it. Um, and then this individual, um, this is Zhang Xue, the second son of Zhang Rei, and he had this enlarged mandibular condyle. So this is the, the, the joint where your jaw hinges with your skull. 
this side on the left was really enlarged. And again, based on my reading of the literature and a differential diagnosis, I think this is also an osteochondroma. Um, neoplasms, so new bone formation in the temporal mandibular joint is pretty rare, uh, but osteochondromas are one of the things that can present that way. Um, so we have basically four, if, if I'm correct that these are osteochondromas, we have four examples of bone tumors out of only 23 individuals, which is a really high incidence. Um, and it's all in the males and they're all relate, the males are all related, right? There is actually such a thing as hereditary multiple osteochondromas. There's a hereditary form of osteochondroma. There are some features of these individuals that fit that, other features don't fit that diagnosis. For example, people with HMO usually have multiple osteochondromas in their body, but they only each had one in their ankle. So you would also need to do an x-ray to definitively diagnose this as osteochondroma. So I'm not totally sure, but tentatively, I think this might be an example of a hereditary benign tumor. Uh, there's, there's other information I don't have time to go into today on oral health and uh, the um, demographics of the cemetery. Uh, so I'm going to leave that to questions or when the paper comes out, <laughs> read about it. Um, so just to wrap up and go back to those three productive tensions that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, we have um, sometimes quite striking disconnects between these skeletons and the texts. For example, going back to Madame Wong, the texts mention, the epitaph mentions this recurring respiratory illness, but there's no evidence in her skeleton of of lesions on her on her ribs or anything. She also had this very dramatic shoulder injury, which would have also made it difficult to keep doing her weaving, though her sons would beg her to rest. And that's not mentioned in the epitaphs. So, oops, sorry. Um, we have rib fractures, we have a facial tumor, we have evident, the lines in the teeth evidence of childhood illnesses. Those are pretty striking bioarchaeological findings, uh, none of which are described in the epitaphs. So um, to the people who composed the epitaphs, those would have been, to the individuals, they would have been important events in their life, but they weren't important um, to include in the epitaphs. The only time that disease or health-related conditions are reported are when they're used to um, support a narrative of long sufferance and stoicism or to illustrate a colorful anecdote about the person's life. So from the historical record alone, all we can know are generalities. All we can know are what might have been typical for a specific gender or class. But the skeletal record can often undermine those assumptions. So for example, from, this, from the textual primary sources, we know that men and women had very different roles in their families and in society. So we, would, we might expect that they would have had different distributions of osteoarthritis in their body from different daily activities or different oral health if they were eating different diets. In fact, I didn't find any sex differences in the distribution of, of arthritis. I didn't find any sex differences in oral health. So they, it actually seems that their daily activities and their diet were not different enough to cause skeletal uh, differences. Uh, we also, because they were wealthy, they were landowners, um, they provided famine relief um, that, I'm gonna come to that on the next slide actually, um, you might assume that because they were wealthy and they were landowners, that when the epitaphs describe the men did farm labor, the women did handicrafts even when they were sick, that maybe those were idealized descriptions. But we have four men with fractured ribs, which I am concluding to the best of my ability were due to being, for example, kicked by donkeys. We have um, also uh, Madame Sher, who I didn't talk about, the first wife of John Ray, had kneeling facets in her feet, which meant that she spent a good amount of time kneeling with her toes bent under, um, again, perhaps doing handicrafts. And so, and we have the pronounced muscle attachments of Madame Wong. So uh, that's actually evidence that even though these were relatively wealthy people, they were working in the fields, they were doing handicrafts. Uh, okay, so, and then individuals versus populations. Um, we know from the broader historical record some trends that held in Ming Dynasty were over of China. We know that, um, for example, the Zhang family were leaders of their community. They were feeding their poor neighbors. They were providing famine relief. Um, 
they worked in trade, they had lumber business, they had um, agricultural land, they may have had income from the pontoon bridge. Um, and they lived through a litany of famines, floods, epidemics, droughts, including the great famine of the 1480s. Um, so we can see there's sort of a, a contradiction there. They were wealthy and, and high status in their local community, but they also lived through a very difficult time. And so we can see in the record of individual people's skeletons, how those larger forces left a mark on people's bodies. So though they were able to provide famine relief, they actually seem to have had a lot of hardship in their own lives. Those, those the linear enamel hypoplasias, the lines in the teeth that I showed, about half of the individuals in the cemetery had LEH, which means that about half of them experienced severe illness or starvation or parasitic infection. We don't know exactly what, but some kind of physical hardship in their childhood. So it seems that despite their status that allowed them to be able to feed their neighbors, it couldn't completely buffer them from the effects of, uh, of the, the famines and the floods and the, the time in which they lived. And it's also possible that the family's fortunes may have fluctuated through time. Um, and then finally, the public versus the private. The Zhang family were not known to modern people before their tombs were discovered and excavated. So the, their burials and the details of their lives were consigned to an anonymous and private past. However, the epitaphs were intended to be public, right? They were, the stone epitaphs were buried in the grave, but then many epitaphs would have been published as collections of work by the scholars who composed them. So they were meant to be passed down to the generations, to edify people, to raise the standing of the family. So they were both public and private. Um, the, um, the burial of the body itself, the funeral procession, all of those, um, activities around the death would also have been public in their time. So the epitaph and the skeleton are both recording a person's private self and their public self, their, their social body, right? In the bioarchaeology, we have a term social body, which is your, um, the body as it interacts with the rest of society, essentially. So we have the skeleton recording very private things, the intimate details of healed illnesses and injuries, and also very public things like the performance of gender, class, and ethnicity through things like foot binding. And then the epitaphs also record public deeds such as charity and uh, dispensing advice and mediating disputes and also private emotions. We have recorded um, people's mourning their, at their father's death, despair at um, suffering a family member's abuse, pride at the success in their children. Those are all private, private things, private emotions that are recorded in the epitaphs as well. So the line between public and private is not really clear in the case of, of osteobiographies of named historical individuals such as the Zhang family. So our findings in this study and the tensions I just discussed, I believe have broader significance both for China studies and for historical bioarchaeology. Microhistorians and osteobiographers have written already uh, about how the study of individuals and the study of populations enrich each other. They form a dialectic. Um, and so by forming that dialectic, we can arrive at a more complex and nuanced interpretation of both, of both our population level studies and our individuals. Um, the lives of the Zhang family in the Ming period show us how social stratification, economic trends, and national catastrophes manifested in the lives of individual people. So we argue that um, both the historical record and the skeletal record, as others have, have eloquently written many times, um, contain not only historical information, but also historiographic information, information on how those records were created. Um, and this small scale approach that we have taken is, is rich in detail, but in the absence of a broader context and comparable studies, it can only go so far. So I hope that this work will be continued by other scholars uh, and, and myself, if the opportunity presents it, um, to expand this kind of detailed microhistoric work to other sites in China, other times and places, and we can build a sort of tapestry of microhistorical studies and then use that to construct an understanding of the differences across time and space in individual people's lives at a very fine grain um, and how the larger events of history were either buffered or exacerbated in the lives of, of individual people.
fantastic, <laughs> truly eye-opening. Yeah. Now, um, who would like to ask the first question? <laughs> yeah, Frank, do you also work with historical periods? <laughs> okay, I'll ask the question. Um, with the rib fractures, yeah. uh, are you able to tell if there were multiple fractures over time, or are you not able to tell because they're all healed? I believe they were at the same event because they line up. This was, this I'm not sure, this was only one broken rib. Um, but then these individuals, even though they have multiple fractures, they line up very well. They're, it's always on the same side, on contiguous ribs, and it's like clearly one line. So I believe this was a single event of being potentially kicked or falling. It could have been falling. It could, it could have been other causes. One is enough to teach you to keep out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> This one is particularly. So for, for those of you who aren't osteologists, this is the sternum, and then this should be just one one line, right? One rib, but it's been broken in two places, so there's three pieces that then healed kind of like this. That must have hurt. That would have hurt. Hopefully once it healed, it didn't hurt, but yes, it would have hurt when it happened. So no descendant of this lineage? Not that we know of, no. No no one in the local area has said that they are, no one, no one at least that we know of knew that the cemetery was there. The cemetery was not marked, um, hasn't been lost, and I don't so, believe there's a Zhang clan. So uh, did the locals tell you or you are where their genealogy came from? They are, old they are, I believe she said that some of them came from the north, not, not, so some of the people in that area seem to have come turned that area during the Qing dynasty, I believe she said. Qing dynasty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, some who had been there since the Mongol period. Okay, so are there? Which period? Mongol. The, uh, the, okay. the, the, period. That's the, what oral, the oral history yeah. is a whole area that, that we haven't yet explored, but would be very valuable. Yeah. This area suffered massacres in the 19th century. I was wondering about the rapture the, before Zuo Zongtang moved in. Yeah, possible. Yeah. yeah, possible. The, uh, the, um, the Muslim rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. So it could have led to pop the population being replaced by a different different. Yeah, I was just curious yeah, of yeah. the extent of these, uh, these riots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, the farthest location that was influenced by the Shanghai for now was even Dali. So this area certainly. Yeah, yeah. The even the Shima area. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I saw these fortresses as associated with this widespread violence. In the 19th century. Yeah, yeah. In the 19th century, yeah. yeah. That's true. We went to Chunpa, there were some there. Oh. How long do you want to take the ribs to heal from a kick like that? They, they could heal pretty quickly, actually. Ribs, wow. the turnover of bone in the ribs is relatively fast. So in a few months, it would wow. have been it would have been pretty well healed. Um, so these could have happened many years before the person's death, but could, could have been, it could have been less than a year, but um, just given how much, in this particular case, it's not just that they've healed, there's like all this extra bone has filled in. So this was probably multiple years of healing. Um, yeah. And as I said, this one, this is not the entire rib. This is a healed broken end, but there should have been another part of the rib here. So the person would have had a, a little floating piece of rib in there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see the dates again? Uh, now I know the whole spectrum. Is oh, it late main? Yes. It's a little Wan Li era. Sorry. That's when the maize came in, sweet potato. That's true. That should be. Will those have any 
So you, so, okay. So maize is a C4 plant. So you, if they were eating a lot of millet before maize was introduced, you would not necessarily be able to see. Oh, I see. Um, but, a, but a paleoethnobotanist could find maize or potato starch grains and find evidence for, for that. You could even do studies of the dental calculus. Okay. So if you take the dental, the, the you know, yes. calcified plaque off the teeth, you can find remains of the food that they were eating on the microscopic level. So no one's done that yet for these people. So it starts earlier than, than the one leap period. That's uh, uh, 1531. Okay. Oh, it's close to the Manila Galleon now. In 1573. Um, well, I'm sure it didn't affect this area that quick. The last tomb is very strange. But the, 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 time, the, the time between death and burial is very strange. So this doesn't normally, necessarily, yeah. you mean this? Yes. It, no, normally a male member died and it would, he would be buried soon. Yeah, so so the burial doesn't necessarily mean that he wasn't buried. It may mean that the tomb was sealed after she died. So it could be that he was buried and then the tomb was left, the, the stone. Yeah, because it's the same date, right? Yeah, oh. they, their, um, their burial date is the same. So probably he died and was buried and then either he was buried in a temporary grave because he died younger and then his tomb was constructed and he was moved or he may have been buried in the tomb but then she was added later and then they sealed it and that's the date that is considered the final burial date that's my i'm not a ming historian that's my understanding of how the burial traditions work but if anyone has a different interpretation please Oops. Zhang Xue was probably buried at the same time as his wife, but there's no there's no burial date given. Zhang Xue is really interesting, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to talk about him. He's the second son of Zhang Rei. He's he uh, did have a scholarly career. He went to the Confucian Academy in Beijing, and he um, when he was like in his seventies, he became a provincial level administrator. And um, his his older brother Zhang Rao had no sons. And so Zhang Xue gave his first son to be adopted by Zhang Rao to become his heir, which is a not uncommon practice. Um, and then later Zhang Rao managed to have a, a child. And so the son went back to Zhang Xue. But um, there's a lot of interesting detail in the, in the epitaphs that I didn't have time to get into today. Gosh. Once I was walking by the Down Traders bookstore in Ann Arbor, I saw this rubbing album uh, of this uh, epigraph <laughs> of Li Hongzhang was was in the window. Uh, at that moment, before that moment, I didn't know that people actually produced these rubbings before it was put in the tomb, and then they incorporate the rubbings in the genealogy book. You bought it. Yes, I bought it. Seventy five dollars, and then there's like railway electricity. Yeah. No, probably not electricity, like railways and industries. And it mentioned that the Europeans call him the Eastern Bismarck. Yeah. In that, which okay. really surprised me. And my understanding is that it was very... So the fact that not all the tombs have epigraphs could mean that they... They, they were wealthy, but they weren't that wealthy, right? They had, they took multiple wives, but serially instead of concurrently, and they didn't all have epitaphs. And so my understanding is that it was pretty expensive because you had to hire someone to compose it. You had to hire a calligrapher to do the calligraphy. You had to hire a stonemason to carve the stone, and then you had to hire someone to do the engraving. So it was a big yeah. production. And those would be named <laughs> in Dali Hojang's case. Uh -huh. Yes. Very interesting work between text and archaeology. Yeah, of course, that's it's methodologically extremely rich. Uh, I, uh, but you can actually test 
yeah. the, some of the texts. Again. And the, the only oral history we have is very informal, just from Yoa's conversations with people, but that's a, that's a whole other area you could explore. Absolutely. Yeah. And she, so some of her looking into the gazetteers, she believes that some of the villages in this area may have been founded as military garrisons or, or settlements of military families because the term Jai in the local nomenclature means uh, a fortress or a, or a fortified place. And so Yangwan Jai might have originally been a fortification. Um, and there's a there's another settlement with that with that character. But then and then also some of the villages aren't recorded in the gazetteer. And so she believes that they are recorded as Junhu, so military families who wouldn't have paid taxes. And so they're not really recorded in the gazetteer because the gazetteer was often for tax purposes. So there might have been some history of military service in the area, but there's no, not a single mention of military service at all in, the, in these epitaphs. Question. Um, besides Madame Wong, were there other examples where epitaphs uh, recorded cases of mythology that were described? Or not really? No, very, very, very few. Um, sometimes it would say like once she, when she became. There was one. I don't remember which one it was, but one of them said um, when he became sick. You know, his there. One of them, his brother, had been away in the south doing business for many years, and they hadn't spoken. And when he became sick a coffin arrived that his brother had sent. And so he, 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 you know, he knew his brother was sick, even though they hadn't spoken in a long time. So there's mentions of being sick, but not, um, not details like the respiratory illness. Yeah. Not that I can, not that I can think of. And none of the, so there's also no children in the cemetery. This is all adults. Um, I don't know what the funerary treatment of the children would have been. In fact, all, there's only of John, Ray's children's youngest daughter died young. It's mentioned, but that's the only mention of childhood mortality in, in the epitaph. So I'm really, I'm not actually sure that they would have had many children who died, but if they did, they were not buried with the full treatment. The calligraphy of the archaic inscription is pretty horrible. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other inscription seems competent. Uh -huh. I mean, the, 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 the command of whichever local scholar did this, um, did this um, cover stone of, uh, of historical writing systems was skin deep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a whole other interesting angle. Yes. Right about the calligraphy. Yeah, of course, these never get into the, um, into the compendia where people um, collect the successful examples of this kind of genre. But this is from the pub. This is from the one of the two published reports. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in, in in the paper that we wrote, it's only it's only summaries of them. That's not the whole text. So, and I and I even removed the fourth tomb that I only had the inscription for and no skeleton, I, I removed that one because the reviewers thought it was unnecessary. So that's not even published yet. So there's just so much more to do. But there's certainly um, potential work by, um, by a historian, to be by a historian. Absolutely. And, and of course, local history at that level is, is often neglected. Uh, how this would fit in, I mean, the, the uh, question relates this also to uh, into, you know, local historical processes. Hardly no. There was also, I think, a terrible earthquake during this part of the main period, sometime in the 16th century, maybe early 17th. So that also could, could have, um, in this area, that could have also um, contributed to uh, of evil. No, I don't remember it. She did some young one drive. Yeah, because apparently the the Wu was a different Wu. Wu, yeah. So it's a, whoever wrote the map confused that Ju for a Wu. Oh. Different from the Wu that's used today. Oh, yeah, sure.
but on the other hand, to have local topography repre uh, represented at this level of detail in the 16th century is not bad by international standards. Mm -hmm. Ah, so this is what they look like. <laughs> of course, an art historian would not talk about visual formulas and yes. you know, beauty ideas. Yes, sort of they thing. don't have bound feet. They, they don't have bound feet. These ones don't. No, these ones don't. But you have two. The women. You're Half two. of them do. Yeah, yeah exactly. I have not. I just don't. And the binding was less extreme than in the Qing Dynasty, it seems. So, what does this, this indicate? Might some of them have been Muslims? Is that something? Wouldn't that have been mentioned in the epitaphs? No? Yeah. I mean, so, so, so one, it could be that some of the families did it and some didn't. It could have been that there was a temporal difference. Because the cemetery spans multiple decades, so it could be the later women have them and the earlier don't. Is that the, is that the pattern? No, we don't know because the the four women with the bound feet don't have epitaphs, so we don't know the exact. There, we don't know their dates. Only four of the twenty one tombs have dates. Could it be that in those cases they were in a different set of circumstances where they could be expected to contribute more in sort of daily chores and tasks that they couldn't really compromise themselves in that way? So, at the, so my understanding is that at this point in the history of foot binding, it was um, not as universal as it was later, say in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so by the end of the practice, even women on in relatively poor families who were doing farm work still had their own found uh, in parts in parts of China. And so it this time I think it's plausible that not all the families would have done it. That it, it just maybe not it wouldn't have been a universal practice, but uh, or maybe some of the families that the women came from were higher status than others. Not sure. It's super interesting. I think Victor and I are both very privileged in the timing of this talk because we just had a core seminar yesterday where we were discussing ideas of like Foucaultian bodily inscription and layers of identity and how you know, scales of community being discussed in, from an anthropological framework and how you know at its basis the community really is a set of overlapping individual agencies but each that cannot be defined by an indefinite sort of agency you know, there is malleability but only to the extent where there are a sort of boundaries and set behaviors that are expected and so this is very interesting also in the scale that it presents like this is you can see it as you know in the framework of you know what is Ming traditions in this day what is perhaps communal behaviorisms and also familial. So it's very interesting to have this much information. And you have the agency of the people who compose the epitaph too. Because as in, in funerary archaeology, we talk about the fact that the grave is constructed by the living people, not by the dead person. So uh, the composition of the epitaph reflects the wishes of the family, right? Yeah. I don't know how much of them are literally true. Exactly. And the skills of those involved in producing them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I talk a little bit more in favor about the difference between the in, this distinction that's not, not mine, but the individual body self, the social body, and the body politics. So your body reflects your individual life, it reflects your social relations, and it reflects your place in the political structure. So has this come out yet? No, it's on, it's a, under review. By? Historical archaeology. Very good. It's been sitting there for a while. You, you've already got reviewers' comments and you've done something about them. It's just something to look for. I mean, this is, this is the kind of work of which there's much too little. I have yeah, a period of which, you know, the potential of archaeology has hardly been tapped. Just a bioarchaeology too. So the foot binding the paper that we published in 2019 um, came out, I believe, the same year as one or two other papers from Shandong, citations, Shandong University. And now there's been maybe a dozen, if that, papers on foot binding, but they've all come out in the last five years, I think. 
Um, and there was literally nothing published on the bioarchaeology of foot binding until four, five, four years ago, I guess. And now there's now there's a dozen papers on it. We have comparative beginnings of a comparative corpus. So, and there's so much that's not known about the practice of foot binding. The specifics, either what age it started at in different times and places, how the technique differed from place to place or family to family, and those are things that could be reconstructed with more more data. Can you explain further, like, you say the, the one in the above is the foot binding Yes. One. What is it different? Because for me, yeah. it sounds, it looks like one is younger, maybe one is younger, one is older, like, one is super so, so this is definitely fully adult because the, the epiphyses, the ends of the bone are fused. Um, and if you look at the base of the bone, this joint surface is, is pretty much its normal size. So like this, so these are, we're looking at the the uh, metatarsals, the top of the foot bones, these five bones. And so these surfaces would have articulated here with the, with the ankle bones, the tarsals. So this surface is a little smaller, but not much than the, than this surface on this bone. So um, the biggest difference is in the shaft. The length, the difference in length is pretty striking. Um, and then the, the width is really different. So this is sort of a thick, sturdy bone, and this is very, very narrow. So the one on the at the top, those are bound. And yes. The one at the bottom. Yes, and this is the this is the the innermost, right? So the thump of <laughs> the big toe, right behind the big toe. But this is the innermost, and this is behind the pinky toe. And you can see the difference is the most extreme on the outer edge of the foot, yes. and the difference on the first is much smaller, um, which is consistent with what we know about the technique, because the usually the hallux, the big toe, was not bound underneath, it was left in its normal orientation and the other four were folded under. Um, so did you also, were you, sorry, I went here like, so were you in the excavation site when they were excavated? Not when they were excavated, I was there, they were excavated in 2014, 15, and I looked at them in 2017, 18, 19. I was wondering if uh, when you, except when you see the report, the picture, the feet are already binded, like, so there, so when they were excavated, it was all disarticulated. Yeah, they were not, there was no cloth or, or clothing of any kind, which would have been helpful, right? Would have been interesting. Yeah. Um, and I, also interesting is that all of the skeletons had the small bones of their hands and feet, which means that if they were buried somewhere else and then moved to the tomb 20 years later, they would have been moved in their coffin. Their bones weren't collected and moved because then they wouldn't have had all of the little bones, so they would have been moved in the whole coffin. That's right. Food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, if not, then let me thank you very much once more. Thank this you. is really fantastic materials and a very interesting analysis.